<laughs> I worship silence. <laughs> silence is cool. Are we having two hours of silence? No, go on. We better go, go do the introductions. Behave. <laughs> yeah, let, let people in first. They're not all in. But can I just yeah. check with the video recording that we're going to be on speaker view, not pinned view, right? Because me and our jumbo both need to be visible. So, um, yeah, we're going to start very soon. In the meantime, I will say hello to people that are tuning in from Facebook as well, because this is on Facebook Live. Although that's not indicated yet, but I'm hoping that is the case. Yeah, cool. So we're also live streaming on Facebook Live. And hopefully there will be more people joining here in the Zoom room. Although Ajahn said quantity is quality, quality is what counts. Quality is more important than quantity, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the ones who are here have to be, yeah, make up for those who are not. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, so we're going to introduce Ajahn Brown first of all, and I know that he's pretty infamous already. So as usual, Ajahn, it's an absolute pleasure, privilege, delight, an inspiration to have you with us. And we're really grateful that you are um, yeah, giving us your time, even at the end of a busy, um, a busy meditation retreat. retreat that you've just been teaching. So yes, hello to people on Facebook. I just saw that we've just started streaming live there now. So in case we hadn't already said hello, hello to you too. So. Yes, a real privilege to have Ajahn Brown with us again. And I'm just going to read out a very short little introduction because as he rightly said before this talk began, who is he anyway? Yeah, so here we go. This is as the story goes. Ajahn Brown is a renowned and beloved meditation master and author of many best-selling books. Trained in Thailand with Ajahn Chah, he's been a monk for over 45 years. Ajahn Brahm is spiritual director of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia and advisor to numerous Buddhist groups, including ours, where he's Yay. actually a, tr a trustee as well. And ours is Anukampa Bhikkhuni Project, for those who are not aware. He courageously pioneered the revival of Bhikkhuni ordination in the Theravada tradition and is passionate about creating opportunities for all people to experiencing sorry, to experience the liberating power of the Buddha's teachings. Despite his huge responsibilities, Ajahn teaches tirelessly and his humorous, insightful talks even save uh -huh. lives. <laughs> so, okay. So I think it's time for you, Ajahn, to okay. do your magic. To start talking and then uh, <laughs> give you an opportunity to put your questions in. It's one thing to talk, it's one thing to teach meditation, it's one thing to uh, make opportunities available for everybody to live you know, the monastic life in whatever sense they can and to live a beautiful lay life if uh, that's uh, what you can do in order to get these teachings out there because they help so much in our modern world. But uh, on this occasion, instead of teaching meditation or giving a talk, it's the opportunity to just answer questions, a Q&A session. And the reason why we do that is because even in traditional Buddhism, we recognize the importance of asking questions. And the story I often tell, especially you know, when there's people right in front of me, uh, is uh, from one of the suttas, where this uh, gentleman asked the Buddha a series of questions. And uh, one of them was, you know, why is it that some people in this world are wealthy while other people are very poor? It doesn't matter how intelligent you are, it doesn't matter how hard you work, some of you, you work so hard, and you know, you, you're very smart, but still, you know, you find it difficult to make ends meet. So why are some people rich while other people are poor? And of course, that was an important question for someone to ask, and the Buddha gave this wonderful answer, and it was so impressive that the man asked another question. The second question was, why are some people beautiful while other people are ugly? It doesn't matter how much money you spend on makeovers or go to hairdressers or spas or get nice uh, dresses or suits. Just some people are just not attractive. Why? 
And of course, uh, those of you who heard me tell the story before, that when I mention the words like ugly or attractive, I always look away from the screen or look away from people. Because the reality was when I mentioned this anecdote, which is in the suttas, that uh, I just happened to be looking at one woman in Singapore when I mentioned the word ugly. And she really complained. She said, Ajahn Brahm, why did you mention the word ugly when you were looking at me? And so uh, from that time on, when I told this anecdote, I always looked away, never kept eye contact. Even though you say, like, beautiful, you've got to look away. Even if it's a guy, they get the wrong idea. So anyway, life is very difficult these days. But anyway, the Buddha gave a good message, a good why some people are beautiful, why some people are just uh, hard to look at. But then the most important part of the little um, story was when the Buddha asked, when he asked the Buddha, why are some people intelligent while other people are stupid? Why is it some people that you don't have to do much work and you get great, great um, grades at A-levels, you get lots of uh, degrees and they're so easy and uh, people are just, are just so good at sort of uh, studies and they're just so intelligent. But other people, it's just so hard even just to get O-levels. Why? And the Buddha gave the wonderful answer the reason why people will be intelligent in their next life, and even in this one, the cause of intelligence is asking questions in this life. So those of you who have just had a difficult time at school or at university, if you made it to university, and you don't want to repeat that in your next life, this is the opportunity for you to ask many, many, many questions. And it doesn't really matter if you get good answers. The fact you do ask questions will guarantee you a nice place in Oxford or Cambridge next, next lifetime, or even uh, uh, other great universities like in Western Australia, where I come from, <laughs> or places where your intelligence does get improved. Because you don't just believe what you're told. You don't just accept what you read in books, but you question it and you test it out. And that means that you take your wisdom much deeper. So questions was always encouraged by the Buddha. It's always part of our tradition. And if you don't get a good answer, you ask the question again, because we don't just want to believe when it doesn't make any sense. So that's one of the reasons why we have a question and answer session, which is a marvelous way of getting people just to, to see more deeply than what they've ever experienced before. So there we go. Now's the opportunity for having an easy education in your next life. <laughs> <coughs> Who's going to give the first question? Okay, so I'll be um, asking the questions on behalf of those who are writing them in. So if everyone could put their question to Q and A Reni, um, she will trickle them into me and I'll put them to Ajahn. And uh, we'll do questions for about 50 minutes and then we'll have a little break and a chance for um, some meditation. And please, can you keep your questions short? I've just noticed there's a bit of an essay there in the chat box, which is fine, but please, uh, out of compassion for me and for Ajahn, please, if you can keep your question nice and concise and to one each, please. Okay. So the first question, dear Ajahn, why do stream entrants have human rebirths until extinguishment and do not end up in higher realms? They don't all have human rebirths. Sometimes people are stream winners, they get reborn and maybe some heaven realm, and sometimes just because of uh, some reflection, they can from the human realm, they can go to, uh, from the deva realms, they can go to, to higher realms. One of the stories which mentions that was of these two monks who did a range retreat uh, you know, in this sort of remote area. And this woman said that she would look after them for the range retreat. She even did the washing of, her robe, of their robes, cooked all their food, 
So they had nothing to do except to meditate all the whole three months range retreat. And then later on, you know, she was, when she passed away, she got reborn, I think, in the the Tower, I think the Tower Things or the Tusita Realm, I can't remember which. But the two monks, she found they were also there. And she said, What were you two scattywag monks doing? I was working hard. I didn't have enough much time to meditate. And you two, you know, I don't know what you did during that range retreat, but you just still in the same realm as I've been in. You know, just you know, why did I sacrifice for you? And they say that one of the monks just ignored her and just carried on enjoying the sensual pleasures of that realm. But the other monk, and this is an, one important uh, part of the story, one of the monks aroused sati, mindfulness. And it wasn't just mindfulness, it was also the memory of what he'd learned as a monk. And learning what he learned as a monk and remembering the, the, uh, the teachings, he disappeared from that realm and got reborn, I think, in the Sudawasa. The pure birds became anagami. So sometimes, you know, even heavenly beings can make the transition from one realm to another realm, you know, of the stages of enlightenment. Sometimes you hear in the suttas that so many devas were listening to a great discourse and they understood some of it and gained enlightenment experiences. Why not? The majority, I would say, would not get enlightened experiences, but some of them would. So anyway, so that's why, just because you're a stream winner doesn't mean you have to come back to this earth just once or seven times. Actually, you don't come back seven times. You don't have seven more lives as a stream winner. You have a maximum of six lives. Because this life is number one, your next life is number two. So you have six more lives. Could be in any realms, not necessarily human realms. Okay. So the next question. Thank you for your kindness and wisdom wrapped in such a gentle, humorous way. Recently, I was told that it's living in the world is much easier than being a monastic. Um, this particular monk said that one should first be successful in one's duties as a regular person, and then what one might be capable to live as a monastic. Otherwise, there's a danger that the person is fleeing from difficulties because you face difficulties in monastic life as well. So I was wondering if I should first do a job training as a caregiver or a nurse, and after I can master this, then lead the holy life. But on the other hand, I think just try and see for yourself. Exactly. See for yourself that it's, people say this, uh, but it's actually easier as a monastic than living in the lay realm. Remember, I know that because I've been in the lay life, in the monastic life 47 years, the lay life 23 years. It's much easier being a monastic. It's more meaningful, more purposeful, and you know how to relax to the max. You have lots of busyness and lots of things to do, but you know how to let all that stuff go when you need to, to let it go. So all the wisdom, all the peace and stillness and kindness which you build as a monastic, it makes it a much easier life, much more uh, fulfilling, which adds to the ease. Of course, you can leave a lazy lay life and just you know, go to the dole and just uh, live... Uh, without doing much work, or the same as with the monastic. Sometimes as a monastic, you can be either lazy or you can be just striving like mad. And not, that's not being a very good example to people. Striving like mad. They forget that part of the training of a monastic in Buddhism is learning how to be kind. It's not just kind to others, it's also kind to yourself learning how to be gentle and patient, learning how to make peace. And sometimes when you're striving, you're working so hard to try and get somewhere, you're not quite sure where that is. And it's madness. One of the reasons why, when before the Buddha became enlightened, he was striving like mad, getting nowhere. You've got this wonderful place of just frustration, depression, or you could even call it depression. 
in the sense of tried everything, nothing works. So what should I do? And that's when he remembered as a sort of six or seven year old boy under the rose apple tree, getting enlightened. How many six or seven year olds you know can strive? I've never seen a seven year old striving. Instead, he knew how to make peace and let go. And be kind, be gentle. And that produced the Sama Samadhi, the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path of Nirajanas. And he neglected that for such a long time because you know, he was thinking like many people think in, in spirituality. You've got to strive, no pain, no gain. But he realized that's the wrong path. The path of gentleness, of kindness, of peace, of softness, which is totally different from laziness. And of course, his first five disciples abandoned him when he started practicing like that. They thought he'd given up. But he found that was the way. And the first teaching he gave those five disciples after he became a Buddha was the middle way to avoid the such striving or such sensual indulgence. It's okay to indulge in the pleasures of the mind, to delight in peace stillness and the joys of deep meditation that's what leads to stages of enlightenment so that she that's why we should never strive okay okay as a westerner what is some advice to balance being a buddhist while avoiding cultural appropriation how can you be a respectful Westerner when you're a Buddhist, but don't have that cultural background? Thank you. It's, it's, I always found that Buddhism, as I like uh, became a Buddhist in, in England, uh, going to Thailand where I spent nine years and understanding how the ties for you Buddhism, going to Australia. And so I like to adapt Buddhism to the different cultures. And it's same, if you ever want to prove this, just get online and get Ajahn Brahm kangaroo, medita kangaroo walking meditation. So I just taught this, I think yesterday in the retreat, that sometimes, in the retreat I was teaching, sometimes that people get a little bit bored when they're meditating. You've got to give it a bit of life and energy. And what I did then was when people were doing walking meditation, if you've done walking meditation before, and you put your eyes down, you walk slowly, being very mindful of your left foot moving, your right foot moving. But just to bring a bit more joy and happiness into that procedure, I said, this is Australia. Let's do Australian walking meditation. And to Australian walking meditation, you start on your path, you put your two feet, to get, feet together, and instead of putting your hands by your side, you put your hands like this. As you can see, like kangaroo. You don't walk, you hop and hop and hop to the end of the path. Now, <laughs> if you see me doing that, people just burst out laughing. It gives a bit of joy and happiness to the meditation. And then you do the ordinary meditation and that joy and happiness which you put in to your heart when you start meditating, that joy and happiness really gives some energy there and it's much easier to meditate. You don't wander off so much because you're enjoying what you're doing. If you haven't seen that, please have a look at a kangaroo walking meditation because I did this once in Penang and all my disciples, about a couple of hundred there, they all got their mobile phones out and videoed it all, and they put it online on YouTube or something. It brings some happiness to your hearts. And from that happiness, you can transmit that to actually the Piti Sukha of deep meditation. So cultural, I don't know. I think all people which I've met, no matter what culture you come from, they just do appreciate Kindness, laughter, peace, and stillness. So, you no, know, the flavors of that, the where the ways you talk about that, that's not important. 
It's just what's inside is important. Okay. So the next person is asking, can we progress along the path even if we don't have access to a physical sangha and personal teachers? I don't live near a monastery and have limited transportation, so have to rely on the internet, books and Zoom, etc. Can this be sufficient? Yes. <laughs> of course it can. And um, what about the Buddha himself? He didn't have a teacher when he was born. He managed to find it out for himself. Okay, it's a special case, but many other people. And I was reading about the stories of enlightened nuns and enlightened monks in the time of the Buddha. Many of them, they just got a very simple teaching. And that was enough for them to go away to quiet places and become fully enlightened. These days, I think we've got too many teachings. How many times do you need to be told to let go? Okay, next question. Okay. Dear Ajahn Brahm, in the Brahma Jala Sutta, it says that there are some aesthetics and Brahmins who, whilst enjoying food given in faith, still engage in gambling that causes negligence. This includes things such as checkers, drafts, checkers in the air, hopscotch, spillikins, etc., etc. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why it is only this select group of games and why specifically these board games. Thank you. Okay, that's just an example. It's not uh, prescriptive, it's descriptive of the sorts of games they would play. But I do remember one story of, from Thailand. There was an abbot of a monastery uh, just around Nakhon Sri Tamarat, no, uh, Nakhon Ratchasima, like Karat. And he disappeared one morning, just vanished, and so did all the money in the monastery coffers. He didn't take it with him because what he was doing, he liked watching English Premier League soccer, and he would bet on the results. And he was no good at it, so he bet away all of the monastery money. And when there's no money left, he fled. And I thought, that's a, such a stupid thing to do. It happens these days. People bet because they think it's an easy way to make money. And if you sometimes, if you're a monastic, they think you've got special powers. You can actually predict who's going to win something. And you know, sometimes that's why one of the reasons, Venerable Chanda, if you do get any powers in your meditation, please keep them quiet. There was this one time years ago when there's a big storm coming to Perth when we're doing a big Waysack ceremony. And during our ceremony, the storm stopped. I mean, it was a, a, a very severe weather event. So it was raining all day, really pouring down. It doesn't usually happen that time of year at Waysack in Perth. And it stopped for the couple of hours we did our ceremony. And the full moon came out. And the videos, people doing videos were going around saying, this is weird, this is weird. And after we finished, the rain came down again and the, the the field flooded, the freeway was closed because it flooded, and the firm, the CEO of the firm, who um, hired out the marquees and seats and sound system, they sent an email to the organizers, say, we don't know who this Ajahn Brahm is, but can you please ask him who's going to win the horse racing today? <laughs> but be careful. You know, it's okay to do you know, wonderful things to make people happy to get rid of sicknesses and stuff. But be careful because people would want to use it to make money easily for gambling. Does that make sense to you? I'm hoping it will make sense to them, but they're all muted, yeah. Ajahn, so we'll have to take okay, yeah. silence as consent. <laughs> okay. Okay. Next question. I've recently taken refuge and I'm training to become a meditation teacher or instructor. I'm mm. nervous but excited. I wonder if you have any advice for someone starting out, especially as I tend to go on a lot. Oh, yeah. Well, I know that. I keep speaking a lot. But now remember that if there's something you don't know, say you don't know. And that impresses people because a few teachers they talk way beyond their experience and sooner or later they got sort of found out you know they may teach things like jhanas but they never experienced anything like that and so 
people actually can feel that when it's coming from someone who has had an experience of some of the states they talk about, it gives their words much, much more power. And they may say exactly the same thing, but it's coming from a different place. But if you come from honesty, you say, well, you know, this is what the, my teacher tells me. This is actually what I believe. This is as far as my experience goes. That gets you much more credibility because you're honest. You're real. And I find out that all the people you teach, they pick that up, whether you're real or whether you're just making it up. So be real, be true to your experience. And of course, when you do teach, you really have to know your stuff, which means it does give you a motivation to practice more deeply. It doesn't mean that the teaching is an obstacle to your training and growth in the Dhamma. In fact, there's been many occasions when people who have been teaching sort of see deeply into the Dhamma and even get stages of enlightenment as they're teaching. So teaching does not need to be an obstacle. Teach from your heart, never teach from your head. Okay, dear Ajahn, what could Buddhist monks like yourself and other monks and bhikkhunis do to encourage the freedom movements in Burma? Is we should encourage freedom movements at times when there is no conflict, because that's the times we have a bit more power. So just because, you know, there's, is there any conflict in UK right now? You know, sometimes that is small conflict compared to places like uh, Burma. But still, wherever we see the opportunities for people who are without power to get a bit more equity, and people who have got power to have restraints on them, so their power is not too much. All cases of bullying are when there is a community with power and those without power. And it's almost impossible for people to resist the opportunity to bully when you are more powerful than others. So that's one of the reasons why it's okay for me. I don't know if even it's really worthwhile for military to have weapons. What do you need weapons for? except to shoot on people who haven't got weapons. So there's no danger to you. So there's an, an inequ inequitable power balance in places like Burma, in Thailand, in many other countries, in Malaysia, where people who have the power do not have the restraints or do not have the organizations which stop them misusing that power and bullying happens. So what I mean when at times when there's not such conflict, in times when there's not such conflict as it is in Burma, that's the time when more people will be able to listen. In times of conflict, many people's ears are closed. And so you may say things, but they will not listen. And of course, it's, there are, people always have weaknesses. And it's those weaknesses which uh, we can exploit to create more peace and, and conflict, solving, conflict solving in our world. People always get concerned what other people think of them. And if we can sort of get through that, you know, the whole world is watching places like Burma. And those people in power, they don't realize just how their reputations is just you know, dropping so low. They can't just say this is fake news. This is real. And so humiliation is one amazing thing which you know, people can't, they have to keep, keep at it. So them and their uh, abilities, their finances, it's supposed to be an interconnected world. Can't we use those connections to 
to make it quite clear to everybody who misuses their power that it's unsustainable. And just like in Buddhism, bad karma, which you do, will come back to you. And you will have to face up to your actions. You cannot hide it. You cannot deny it. What sort of person do you want to be? And that can sometimes inspire people to turn around, to drop their guns, to actually to uh, not really rec reconcile, yeah, to have these Buddhist ways of amnesty. So we don't look to punish people because punishment will come by itself. We learn how to give people the opportunities to realize they're acting in a very, very, very unpatriotic, bad way when they use bullets on their own people. Anyway, it's a big issue. So there we go for now. Okay. So, dear Ajahn, can consciousness be alone without the aggregates? And if not, then how can the mind make the body after death? Is it consciousness that carries our karma forward into the next life? Okay, now there's a major mistake in that statement. It was calling consciousness. If you look at the Buddha's teachings, it always says there's no such thing as consciousness. There's six consciousnesses. So whenever I, I describe the five candles, the five, what I call the groups of existence. They're like form. Uh, well, most people say feeling, perception, will, and consciousness is. The fifth consciousness, the six of them, and they're all totally different. In order to answer that question, you have to separate the five worldly consciousnesses I said that really with carefully, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching from the sixth consciousness called the mind. Obviously, the five consciousnesses depend upon the body. So when the body dies, falls apart, so does your five senses. And then just what happens after you die, the sixth consciousness, totally different type, the mind, doesn't die when the body dies but it's still subject to cessation in a later period of your life as a meditator. Even the consciousness is subject to cessation. I'm talking here about the mind consciousness. And just what the karma from the past, that is just a part of not stored anywhere, but it's just what is, even like David Baum notice, what is it? Uh, Involved, not involved, but enfolded, uh, implicate uh, in the uh, the process of conscious of mind consciousness. In other words, you all know things like habits. Why is it so hard to change habits? Now, even they're not stored anywhere, but when we look at the thing in a certain way. We tend to look at it in that way again. It's very hard to change the way we look at things. That's why, you know, someone who's a Christian or a, a Hindu or a Muslim, it's very hard for them to see the world in another way. Of course, it can be done, but it takes a huge amount of time and very, very strong experiences. But certainly, so that mind consciousness, the mana vinyana or the chitta or the vinyana, whichever one you call it, that, that again is a process which continues. And processes which continue, they do carry the seeds of what happened before. Great simile of a mango. You eat a mango today and then you put the seed in the garden and the mango or the mango seed germinates and grows. And then it grows into a small, looks like a piece of grass, and then a, a twig it looks in the ground and it gets thickens up. It's a little sapling. You don't know what tree it is. And it grows bigger and bigger and bigger, throws a few branches out, becomes a small tree. And at the end of some of those twigs, there's little flowers. The flowers get germinated. 
And at the base of the flowers, it swells, gets fatter and fatter, and that becomes a mango, your new mango. And when that's ripe, you know, you can eat it. What went across from the first mango to the last mango? There was no such thing as, as uh, original mango-ness going across all the time. It was a cause and effect process. And in that cause and effect process, because the next effect is restricted by the course, it means it does carry across what we perceive as its history, as its karma. You can't get an apple tree out of a mango seed. So that means that you know, as you go from life to life, you find there is some similarities. And there's some things which you've learned, or rather, let go of, you don't have to let go of again. So that's why it's not a case you get reborn and you have to start all over again. Even worldly things, you get Mozart's, you can do symphonies at four, you get the uh, child prodigies, you get incredible mass uh, questions at such a young age. You get people who can meditate and get into jhanas at six or seven years of age under a rose apple tree. Where do you think that came from? That came from the past experience of the Buddha. So anyway, yeah, go on. Okay, we've got about 31 questions now, Ajahn, you'll be happy to know. So. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try and do them fast. Yeah, okay. Well, there's a few deep ones, and perhaps the next one is a fairly brief one. What made you get interested in Buddhism? In meditation. That's really interesting. And of course, you know the old story. I'll be brief about it. I had a girlfriend, good sex. I'm being honest with you. People tell me off for this, but I don't care people telling me off. And that uh, I was a lay person. I went to my first meditation retreat and had some really good meditation. That was better than sex better than orgasm. And that really blew me. This is some amazing stuff, this Buddhism. And that was only just one experience of that first retreat. Even your mindfulness got so incredibly strong that you know, when we went for a walk in the morning, I got to the entrance to the Cambridge Botanical Gardens. And there's a clump of bamboo there. And that clump of bamboo looked absolutely gorgeous. I was supposed to go for a walk. I just, first of all, stood, and then I just sat down. Because I couldn't take my eyes off the most beautiful piece of bamboo I've ever seen in the whole world. I re returned there eight days out of the nine, sat on the bench and spent 50 minutes just staring in awe at this clump of bamboo. And once the retreat was over, a few days later, back to studies, uh, busy social life, then got on my bicycle, wanted to see my most beautiful clump of bamboo again. When I got to it, it wasn't beautiful at all. This is in Cambridge. You know, it's, in, it's the wrong weather to have bamboo. And so it was this really sickly, desiccated, dry, dusty, the leaves weren't all that bright. And I thought, what happened to this most beautiful clump of bamboo? And I realized it was the same clump of bamboo I was watching. But when I watched it with a mind which had been enhanced by stillness, when the five hindrances had been uh, suppressed, you could see so much beauty in there. Those sorts of experience re realized that this Buddhism and the meditation was amazing. You could see in your own experience how it developed the depth of your perception and the experience of bliss, which was you know, way better than anything I've experienced before. Now that was really tantalizing, enticing. But you're really interested in this Buddhism. Okay. okay. How is dependent liberation connected to the Four Noble Truths? Dependent liberation, I'm glad you used that word because Sometimes they got the dependent origination. And so many people talk about the, the and 11 links of dependent origination. And they say, Ajahn Brahm, there's 12 links. It's not 12 links, it's 12 things. So there's links between them in the chain. So, and those 
but they always say about dependent uh, uh, origination. And I like the word dependent cessation, which is what happens when things stop. And if you look at the way the Buddha always taught, it's when the uh, awija delusion is overcome. That's where this, this uh, cause and effect relationship is stopped. That's why you see the Four Noble Truths. And you see them not in the way you expected them to, to see, not the way you, you learned them in the book. Please excuse me, but you know, it's late at night for me and I've done a lot of teaching, so I'm just going for broke. I don't care if you agree with this or not, you understand it or not. Here it comes, that, that when you see you know, the results of uh, getting, say, um, you know, some jhanas, your mind is so powerful. It's not just you know, the five hindrances being abandoned and, and stopped for a while. It's also just what you've experienced. And the simile which I've used, which you know, is the best I can come up with, is the simile of the tadpole and the frog. How can a tadpole ever understand the nature of water? How can a human being ever understand the nature of the body and the mind? Until they've seen and experienced the body vanish in the, the jhanas. So what happens with the tadpole? It becomes a frog and it jumps out of the lake, out of your usual experience. So that's what happens in the first jhana. Your body is gone. The five senses have stopped. Now you can talk to somebody. They can't hear you. You can touch them and they don't feel it. An uh, example of that, this who said he was a, uh, an Indonesian monk. And uh, he did some meditation before he became a monk, a monk as a hermit in the middle of Java many years ago. And uh, he meditated, he told me about the experience, and it's a classical jhana experience. Meditating there, and didn't know for how long, and then he saw this star come into his mind, this huge star. And he said he married that star, united with it. That was his English, the best he could say. And then when he came out of his meditation, he noticed the jungle where he was sitting had changed. He could hardly recognize it. There was a lot of destruction around him. He checked with the local villagers and there had been a flash flood there. And he'd been meditating there for about five or six days. I don't know, maybe two or four days. But somewhere around that time, not just five minutes or an hour, two hours, there were days in there. I mean, uh, he checked with the villagers, there'd been a flash flood, and he'd been under a couple of meters of water at this time. Didn't feel a thing because the sense of her touch had just disappeared for a while. And he was perfectly safe. There's no damage to his body at all. And he'd been in this very, very deep meditation. And I remember him telling me that, and you could tell by this monk was an incredibly strong person. And that was typical of the giant. Now he knows, of these experiences, what it's like when your five senses, which define your body, when they totally stop, and the mind is blissed out. And you're in that bliss, and for in this case, for days enjoying it immensely, and your body just cannot be harmed. And this is not just superstitious stuff. Before I was a monk, I was a theoretical physicist at Cambridge. You were trained not just to believe blindly, but also not to reject evidence just because it doesn't fit your views. Real experiences, no hindrances. And then you can see these things and it's mind blowing. Okay. Go on. Ajahn, you said it's important to ask questions, but what if you doubt too much, have wrong views, and it's difficult to find a path and a teacher? Okay, it's good to question. Please always question. But then sometimes we don't know when questions are going to be useful. So, similarly, which I often give is that when I was at university, I was poor. My father had already died. My mother was living in a council flat. You're we supposed to get a grant, but I never accepted any money from my mother. I, I couldn't do that. She was poor herself. So 
that I got jobs. And when I went on holidays, I used to go up to the north of Scotland, up in the Highlands, the North Highlands, and just meditate there in the, in the, in the mountains, live very simply, alone in a tent. And anyway, that when I needed to get a good rest or get a wash, you go to the youth hostel. And one youth hostel I went to, only about two people were there. The warden of the youth hostel, myself and a couple of others going through. And the warden saw me and said, do you want to come up and walk for, to the mountain today? It was a beautiful sunny day. So I went up with the warden of the hostel, a local boy, to the top of one of these mountains. When we got up there, we had a couple of oranges, enjoyed the view. It was a beautiful day. And I said, there's another mountain close by. Let's go up that one. He said, no, you go up alone. And he wanted to go back. So I went up the second mountain alone. And then as I was getting up to the top of the second mountain, I couldn't believe how quickly the clouds came in. It was like five minutes. There was a clear sky. And then there were clouds over every part of the sky. And then the clouds came down on the top of my mountain. And I really couldn't see, you know, when I had my hand out, the end of the hand. It was really thick mist. And it surprised me so much, but I wasn't worried. I just retraced my steps. And then I found out I wasn't retracing my steps at all. And I came very, no, this is no exaggeration again, came very close to a cliff. And one more step and I wouldn't be here today. I'd have been dead. No one would have found you for days. So I checked later on, I was going in totally the opposite direction I thought I was. In the mist, you think you have a sense of direction, you don't. There's no mobile phones in those days and I didn't have a compass. So anyway, I got scared. This was life and death. And so I was a physicist, so I used a lot of gravity. <laughs> water flows downhill. And up on those Scottish mountains, there's still so much water around. I found a little creek and followed it downhill. It didn't matter which way it moved. I zigzagged all over the place. But I was going to follow that uh, creek of water. It joined another creek. It joined another creek, got bigger and bigger and bigger as I was walking down. And what was amazing, it was in mist all the time. And then mist really thick, and then a couple of more steps, you are under the mist. That's how fast it was. But you couldn't really see where you were going, but you're just following water, and you were going downhill. And two more steps, and you could actually see everything. You're underneath the cloud, and you could see your way home. You're safe. And that simile I've used many, many times. If you don't know which way to go, so many teachers, so many different ways of doing things, so many questions. What actually leads you to feeling more peaceful, more kind? Kindness is an important thing. More peaceful, more kind, more alert, less hindrances. Feel, you feel better. Your mind is more powerful. What makes that happen? And go in that direction. And then you come to a time when you go underneath the cloud. You know what that's called in this simile? That's called seeing the Dhamma becoming a stream winner. You're underneath the cloud. You can see exactly which way you need to go. No doubt anymore. Okay, so that's a simile of being lost in the Scottish mountains. Okay. Okay. Shall we do one more before a short break, Ajahn? We've yeah, got a sure. lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So I'm not sure how many we'll get through, but uh, yeah. the next Actually, question. I, don't you go on. Go on. No. I was just going to say, we were going to do a guided meditation, but for 15 minutes, I don't think it's really worthwhile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. just have a 10 minute break for a toilet break, and then we we'll go back to questions. Okay. I'm happy to do that. Okay. So would you like another question now or the break? Yes. First? No question. My father has been abusive towards me for a long time. I decided to have no contact. How to remain compassionate? Uh, you can always love a tiger at a distance. It's an old Chinese saying I, I learnt. You know, if you try and kiss a tiger, you get bitten or scratched. There's no reason why you can't so send food to the tiger. So if that's your father, he was abusive to you. You know, remember, that's not the total character of your father. 
you know, he was times, if you remember, you find those times he was probably loving to you. And if he was abusive, there was something causing that. That's not his real nature. Even Angulimala, because so many people became totally enlightened before Arahat. So don't judge a person at all, especially not by you know, the bad behavior, which is so close to you because you had to experience it. See if later on, at least you can actually send him. He's a human being. Even before he's your father, he's a human being. And we chant very often, may all beings be happy and well. Even if that's your father. He's a being, and that counts. And so at least give him some love. At a distance, because you don't feel ready yet, and you may not feel ready to actually forgive that hurt of the past. But you know, it's a wonderful thing. And I've worked with abusive, abusive parents. And sometimes they feel incredibly guilty, but what can I do now? It's like they've got a life sentence and you know, they can't even meet their children or their children's children. And they regret what they've done. So whenever something bad like that happens, please use that for learning, for growing. My own personal experience of that, my own father, could never hit me, even though I deserved it. And the reason was that my paternal grandfather was an abuser. I don't know if it was sexual abuse, but certainly physical abuse. My father, he never talked about my paternal grandfather, his, his, <coughs> his father. And so one day I just, I just, um, I demanded that my dad tell me about my my paternal grandfather, who died in Liverpool during the Second World War, he died, we probably found out, of, of um, typhoid. Oh, ty yeah, I think it was typhoid. Not, not a bomb or anything, just of sickness. But anyway, Bertie, please excuse me. But I use this word, no, not as a derogatory, but this is what my father said. He said, your paternal grandfather was a bastard. Because he would go home, go in, before he'd come home after working as a plumber, he'd get drunk almost every night. And when he came home, he'd take off his leather belt. He whip anybody. Sometimes my dad was on the end of that belt for no reason at all. And he said that hurt, but not as much as when he saw his mother being whipped. Now this man's wife, simply because you know, he was out of his mind, drunk. And he said, my father said that hurt so much because he loved his mother and he couldn't protect her. So that was a major trauma, not receiving the belting, but seeing someone else he loved received and not being able to assist. And he said to me that he made a resolution. If ever I survive, if I do survive, and if I have kids, I can, I will never beat them. No. <laughs> That's why he could never, he could never hit me. Because as soon as he tried, he thought of his father, and he just couldn't do it. It didn't mean I so abused that kindness. I was inspired by it. So there was someone, I'm sure you meet no many others who received abuse, but decided to learn from it and never ever do that to anybody else. A positive way of dealing with this abuse which happens. Learn from it. One more, Ajahn, before a break. Yeah, go on, yeah, sure. Yep. Okay. During my meditation, I get scared when I feel different experiences. As a result, I come out of meditation. What is your advice <laughs> on this? First of all, you're in good company. Because even the Buddha said he got scared you know, before as a Buddha of some of the deep meditations. And he said of many other people being scared, this is big things you're doing. Number one, what you're experiencing is very powerful and it's beyond your control. Now you get into these even nimitta states before jhanas. And don't ever say that nimittas were commentary and not taught by the Buddha. 
the whole sutta, the Upakalesa Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, talks all about you know, the problems with nimittas and how to develop them and go past those problems. The only difficulty was that you know, Bhikkhu Bodhi is a very great monk, but he translated nimitta, a Pali word, as that thing. When I first read that sutta, was in Pali, so nimitta is all over the place. So anyway, so those nimitta are incredibly powerful. And you, know, you can't control them. If you try and do something with them, they just disappear. So you're experiencing something which is really enormous power. And the only way you can do that is to let go of your sense of self. To let go, not control, let it be. That's one of the reasons why the whole of Buddhism is, is rife we saying these things don't belong with, to us, not us. And why I was saying to people on the retreat, which I just concluded, that well, I say it to you, Ayachanda, you know I respect you and known you for such a long time. Ayachanda, you will never be able to attain jhana. You can't do it. You know that. You have to disappear first. Ayachanda has to vanish in meditation. So your sense of identity as the doer, the one driving your car or bus, has to vanish. That's that amount of letting go is required. To some people, that's scary. Just like it's scary to a baby in a pram, just having their ice cream taken away. When they realize it's not their ice cream, they don't attach to it, it can go. So your sense of control, your sense of self, your sense of being the, the driver of your car vanishes. And then there's nothing between you and the jhanas and, and the enlightenment experiences or whatever. It's letting go of the sense of self. When you don't do that, you're afraid. When you realize you've got nothing to lose. Wonderful. You let them happen. And it's amazingly powerful and safe. Okay, lovely. So should we have a, a halfway <coughs> five minute or 10 minute break? <coughs> what do you yeah, have a, maybe have a, I'm okay because it's quite warm here. So I don't need to go to the toilet, but I think many of you may do. So okay. let's have a five or 10 minute break. After a couple of years, you know, the the president of the Buddhist fellowship there, he was a lawyer. And he said, I've listened to your talks on YouTube and now I've listened to them here. Can you not teach some deeper Dhamma? Like you teach to the monks. You know, enough about two bad bricks and opening the door of your heart. He said, can't we have some really deep stuff? <laughs> and I said, okay. And I gave this deep talk that night on the nature of self. And the following morning, when he picked me up for breakfast, he said, Ajahn Brahm, never do that again, please. I said, why not? Didn't you enjoy it? He said, I loved it, but I couldn't sleep the night. I was thinking about that so much, it made a huge effect on me. And I said, that's why, I said, please don't do that. We was, he said he was scared. And he was a lawyer, top lawyer in Singapore. I think later moved to Hong Kong or Taiwan or somewhere. But he was an amazing person, very kind. But also just when he heard the Dhamma is too much for him, he couldn't sleep. Yeah. I guess, Ajahn, if it wasn't too much for us, we'd all be enlightened, right? Indeed. But then sometimes we think if it's time sort of reticent of teaching you this, and I'm not doing my job. Yeah. So you've got to teach teach the whole works why not yeah and it's there in the sutras anyway if we have any doubt right no because what happens if it's in the sutras we interpret the sutras mm -hmm. we translate it our particular way and that's why even things like consciousness is we think consciousness or things like original mind which is nowhere in the sutras at all no. Or you can even say like uh, uh, Kanika Samadhi, just a momentary concentration and 
Number one, samadhi doesn't mean concentration, it means stillness. But imagine if you called momentary stillness, it's an oxymoron. And so now with computers, you can type in the word kanaka samadhi and it doesn't appear anywhere in the suttas mm -hmm. or the Vinaya. It wasn't taught by the Buddha. And that gets a few people or like dry insight, sukha vipassaka. There's no, there's no, not in there at all. It's an invention afterwards. Yeah. But then you've got to have someone who's not scared of saying that. But the evidence is there. It doesn't exist in the time of the Buddha. Eightfold path, nice and simple. Yeah. I think, Ajahn, that um, in the Upper Kilesa Sutta, Majjhima 128, isn't it? Yeah, I've got. I think I've got a more recent translation because now Bhikkhu Bodhi is translating it as light and a vision of forms. Yeah, so but it's getting actually, closer. But what the word he's translating is nimitta. Yeah. yeah. So you know when it's a you know it's a word that many of us use, you know, to describe our meditation or even jhanas. I mean, what on earth can you do except call it jhana? First jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. There are some words which don't have an equivalent meaning in English. So we have to use you know, the meaning in, um, uh, in the language in which they originated. Yeah. You say the Buddha enlightened one or the holy one or something, but why not just keep it as a Buddha? Because mm. nowadays everyone in the world knows what that means. We're actually adding to our vocabulary rather than diminishing our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the word Dhamma. We yeah. always say that in the Pali, right? Or in the Sanskrit. Indeed, yeah. Yeah. So leave it as that. Yeah. But sometimes translators, there's almost that they're rules. They're translators. They're not really so intending to make this Dharma intelligible by the ordinary people. Mm -hmm. They want it to be usable by other scholars. Yeah. And that's a difficulty. Absolutely. Having said that, I want to just give a bit of a plug for the um, Samyutta Nikaya, the Kanda oh, yeah. Samyutta. And then Idana yeah. Samyutta, because in there it's really clear about the nature of self and the nature of the five kandas. Yeah. And these suttas are repeated, right, again and again in different ways. Yeah, indeed, yeah. So Nidana Samyutta is just all the teachings about dependent origination, yeah. cause and effect. Yeah. And you've got the Samyutta, um, the Kanda, no, Kanda, Kanda Samyutta. Samyutta, and also I was thinking the Satipatthana Samyutta. Mm -hmm. And so there you get a total new idea of what this uh, Satipatthana means. Yeah. Little things like the rise and fall. It doesn't mean rise and fall, it means the causes for these things originating and why they cease, why jitter ceases, mm -hmm. why form ceases, why Vedana. I prefer calling Vedana experience. Not just feeling, but the, the thing which you describe with certain feelings, present experience, unpleasant experience, or neutral experience, but it's the experience itself, which I think is a much more powerful translation of Vedana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it makes a much deeper meaning of the stage of the cessation of feeling well, yeah. and perception. Yeah, it's not as if you don't, you know, you're still experiencing things, but you're not... Uh, giving it uh, this is pleasant, unpleasant, or it's anything. You're not judging it. It's just the experience itself vanishes. Mm. Yeah. Now I told that ex experience um, to the retreatants, which I just uh, you know, sent home a few a uh, few hours ago, about that time as a you know, as a meditator, lay person. The only retreat place I could get to was in a place called Throssel Hall, a Zen retreat. Mm. I didn't know what Zen meditation was, but I knew how to keep my mind peaceful and still, and what I'd learned so far. And then when I went there, I just they just said, look at the wall, your eyes open, that's it. Not much instructions at all. Because I knew how to, you know, to be in the moment and to not allow the thinking to happen. Then I was just watching a white wall with no thoughts in my mind. And then the white wall was vanished, it disappeared, it was really weird. <laughs> My eyes were wide open. There was nothing there. Mm -hmm. And it was, I was not afraid because in the six, late 60s, it was cool 
to have experiences <laughs> like that. So I let it happen. Well, this is weird. And then afterwards realized what it was was the same as when you have a computer screen, you don't click any button, nothing moves, it turns off. That emptiness, that stillness when things disappear is the mind's default state. So if you just sit there, you don't do anything, you don't strive, things become still. And after stillness, things vanish. Sight vanishes, sound vanishes, smell, taste, and even physical feelings. The body turns off, doesn't need to work. And your mind gets all that energy. That sixth sense becomes so incredibly bright and beautiful and powerful. Those have become the nimittas and jhanas. And you yeah. understand the relationship between the mind consciousness and the other five consciousnesses. You're seeing five consciousnesses just totally turn off and vanish. They're distant from you. You can't contact them for a while. All you've got is a mind consciousness. You get to know what that is. If you really get to know what it is, you know why you can never say that's going to last forever. Mm -hmm. Or it's original or permanent, that too finishes, stops. You're not afraid of that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Some teachers, Ajahn, say that um, the five other consciousnesses arise within the mind consciousness, as if the mind consciousness is there and the other things are coming in it. But I think when you're able to separate them all, you can actually see the mind consciousness coming in between the other senses. Is that more correct? correct? When it's one consciousness, the other ones don't exist. And that's exactly how the Buddha stated it. You need to have an object of mind consciousness for mind consciousness to, to work. Mm -hmm. So when you only have the objects of the seeing consciousness or hearing consciousness, the mind conscious stops for a while. But for so many people, one of the similes I gave was looking at a beach of sand. From a distance, it looks continuous. You go close to it and you find that it's just little grains of silica, which if you look even closer, not even touching. The space is between. It's the same with conscious experience, the space is between one moment of consciousness and another moment of consciousness, which is really cool. It's how the Buddha taught it, but people resist accepting it. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> so I guess that ends the little interlude. Okay, <laughs> okay, now I'll go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my fun. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Okay, you deserve that. Thank you. So, shall okay. we go back well, to yeah, other questions, questions. And, yes, and see how many of those we can we can get to? Yeah. So the next question, dear Ajahn, when meditation becomes uncomfortable, I get out first. But when I get back in again to meditate, it becomes hard to get that comfort back. It is. So one of the reasons why when I do guided meditations, I first ask you to please uh, be aware of your body, do a body scan. And as you're scanning the body, just to find out what's happening, be, be kind to your body. Relax it, move it, scratch it if it needs to be scratched. And so you get another cushion, sit on the chair. Even if you're really ill, lay down on the bed. And I got one of my most beautiful, no, not one of the most beautiful, but a very deep meditation, just when I was sick, lying in the hospital bed in Ubon in Thailand. And this, and my posture was all over the place. I was not comfortable at all when I started, but afterwards when I came out, oh, it was really brilliantly comfortable. But this is one of the things that if you can train your body to relax pretty quickly, but don't go looking at the breath or you know, doing other things. You know, if you're going on a journey, you get your car to be just you know, well-oiled, well, um, enough air in the, car, in the tires, enough petrol in everything and the oil and water. You have to make sure you prepare your car before you have a, good, a long journey. It's the same with your body. You make sure it's really comfortable as best you possibly can. And a little trick, you know, which I, I don't mind saying I discovered it because I hadn't done it before. No one taught me this. That when my body become really relaxed, 
I noticed it was so delightful. It was pleasurable to be relaxed. And so I'm rebellious enough to investigate these things. And I also know that it's okay to experience delight as a monk, especially this delight which is not part of the five senses. And I notice that that delight you feel with a relaxed body is the same delight as you feel with a, a peaceful breath. It's the pity secret comes from the jitter from the mind. And so when the body gets really relaxed, it gets so delightful, I focus on that delight. And then it gets even more relaxed. So when I start meditation, my body is just so incredibly relaxed. More relaxed than probably I was when I was a young man. And so then I can just let the body go and go to, I call it peaceometer. Just a word which I use to describe to others. I know how peaceful I am or how agitated. That's an important part of the mind. And what I'm actually doing here is pretty close to the third Satipatthana. How peaceful is your mind? How unpeaceful is it? And what cause is that? And then you see it's just simple things like be in the moment, no interfering, letting go, being kind, open the door of my heart to this moment, no matter what it is. And that makes the peace moment to go really, really down to get incredible peace. And peace is also delightful. You love it. It's my, one of my best friends. I don't control anything. I don't try and get somewhere. I'm not saying, oh, what's next? What am I supposed to achieve next? You don't achieve anything. You don't achieve. You vanish, first of all, and all these things come up. So little by little, when you're really peaceful, this, your sense of self disappears. You're not driving any car. You're just sitting there, really peaceful. And because it's delightful, you don't need any thoughts. Thoughts are just ways the mind looks for something to entertain itself when it's bored. And sometimes we believe those thoughts are useful. They are not. After meditation, they can be useful. But in meditation, they're just such a hindrance. And the mind gets so still, you get started getting blissed out. And then things like the breath come up. Come up because there's anything left moving. Then the breath becomes so soft and disappears. Just like the, the body disappeared, just like you know the, the breath disappears as well. That's when the limiters used to come, really powerful. And then the limiters disappear. That's when the jhanas happen. And all of these things, it's not things which you aim for, things which happen. All right. Okay. Next question. Having listened to your talk since the late 90s, I've noticed that your teaching emphasis and style has changed. Have you seen or understood something differently that has changed the emphasis of your teachings? Or is it just a natural progression of style? It's a natural progression, but maybe it's that you've listened to different parts of those teachings. Maybe that you're interpreting it in a deeper way. Maybe I'm always teaching the same, but then I'm using different language and different metaphors. So that's why sometimes I say this because we were having a question at um, my recent retreat, what did Ajahn Chah teach? Because I remember I was with Ajahn Chah for nine years, close to him, and my Thai and Laotian, because he spoke mostly Laotian, was very good when I was there. And sometimes he asked me to translate for him even. So he trusted my understanding of what he said. And uh, at his uh, funeral service, all the Western monks, we had this little argument, what did Ajahn Chah really teach? And of course, now my predecessor, this monk Ajahn Chakra, I still respect a lot. And he said that, that every monk has got a different understanding of what Ajahn Chah taught. Because we listen to what he teaches and that which really makes sense to us, that which inspires us, that's what we remember. Parts of his teaching, which he, which he spoke, which make no sense to us, we forget, we disregard it. So there's as many Ajahn Chahs as there were monks who listened to his teachings. 
It's the same with you know, me. I'm not an Ajahn Chah, but however many people listen to me that have many different ideas of what I teach. Okay, there's um, a lot more questions, so I'm going to have to put some a little bit together. There's a few about different traditions, so yeah. um, this is one of them. So it's talking about Mahayana, and this one mentions Zogchen and some Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Yeah. So there are some Buddhist teachers that highlight um, the Zogchen teaching from the Tibetan Buddhism very much. In Zogchen, the focus is resting in the all illuminating wisdom space, the Rigpa or pure mind that is the basis of all existence. I wonder why this is called a Buddhist teaching since it doesn't appear in the suttas. Do you know if Zogchen is coming from sources like Abhidhamma or Visuddhimagga? The one place it's coming from, you already gave the clue there, to say in the pure mind and residence of all things, there is no such thing as a pure mind. And the mind disappears and vanishes. This is very clear how the Buddha said, you know, it's uh, in the, uh, what's it called, the Udana Samyutta? That's not the Udana Samyutta, well, Nidana Samyutta. That's where the Buddha said it'd be much better you know, if people thought this body was their self, because the body lasts for a long time with hardly any discernible change. Since the last time I saw you on Zoom, Ayachanda, you look pretty much the same. And that's, I don't know how many days that was, but, but uh, a couple of days, five days or something. But your mind is changing so much. And it's like the Buddha can't understand why people say there's a pure mind. The mind is a process. It is always changing. You might be like, like even Western philosophers said, you stand on the bridge and look at the river Thames or the river, uh, oh, in Oxford, Cam. what's it, the Chel Cam? Uh, hey, not, that, that no, Cam that's Cambridge. Chel was it Chelwell? Uh, Chelwell, yeah. Yeah, okay. You look at the Chelwell you know, from a bridge in Oxford, it looks the same today as it looks yesterday, but all that water has flown past and flown through, it's not the same at all. So when we go past appearances, we find the mind is always changing. And there's no such thing as a pure mind which is the mind, a process. Sometimes that water under the chair walk is more pure than a few days earlier, but it's still got pollutants in it. The mind would not be able to continue if it had no pollutants. In other words, when the mind is really free of things like delusion and wanting, it stops. That's one of the things in the purest mindfulness you can get is in the fourth jhana. And after that, the, the so-called arupas, which the Buddha talked about, that's where the mind starts to disappear. It turns off, it vanishes. That's why they're really interesting, those states. You know, the, this mind, so-called pure mind, it starts to disappear. It's not there anymore. And that is fascinating. That's you know, what they call nevasanya nasanya. So no, not so dumb. Asanya Asanya Vediati Niroda. In other words, the cessation of all that's to be experienced or perceived. Existence stops. That's powerful. In other words, where does this pure mind go? It's vanished, it's not there anymore. Ajahn, on that question of where things like the Zogchen tradition and other traditions come from, yeah. which talk about the pure mind, do you think it's possible that they've attained certain states of meditation but haven't gone beyond them? Oh, of course, yeah, that's where sometimes people even get a first jhana. Hmm. And you get a first jhana, my goodness, it blows your mind. The biggest thing you've ever experienced. Pure bliss. And a lot of your sense of self, especially the five senses, is gone. So is your will mostly gone. It's not totally gone, the first jhana, second jhana, it totally goes. So imagine if you had that experience, you think that's union with God. Many people, it's fascinating. You know, people ask St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Christian saints, when they just you know, get into a first jhana for whatever reason, that's how they interpret it, because they're not there. Their sense of self is gone. 
but you know what they experience is bliss. And you know, interestingly, that sometimes people don't experience it as bliss; they interpret it as pure love, that like pure metta. It's fascinating that metta and bliss, you know, they just they come together, and it's just whichever way you want to see it. It's not two different things; exactly the same thing. Powerful. And afterwards, you say, "Wow, that was amazing." You know, and you, you think you're enlightened. But, you know, after a while, you find out there's a few more jhanas. <laughs> Just next, you have a look at some of those, and you realize that this mind, now you've seen it pure, it's not God. This pure mind, even, is impermanent. It vanishes. Good. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. I was just waving to Grace's girl. Hi. Okay, yeah. Hi, yeah. <laughs> hey. Good. <laughs> I can't see you in there, but hi. Uh, she's down there. Yeah. <laughs> so the next one is about the Vinaya. So before the Buddha had Padinibbana, he told that the lesser Vinaya rules can be changed, but it was not done. Um, I think the rules have to be reviewed simply because of the different way of societies, as long as the Dhamma is at the heart. At your place, you told us that monks and nuns are seen as equal. Venerable Brahm, how is your view of the Vinaya rules? First of all, the Buddha said it can be changed by the Sangha, not by an individual. And if you ever try to get any agreement by a Sangha, I mean, you call the whole Sangha, <laughs> it's like trying to get an agreement in, in the British Parliament. <laughs> There'll always be some people objecting. And the point is that you know, for the Vinaya, it has to be unanimity. And the Buddha said that, but the Buddha also said that, you know, that these are the rules laid down by the Buddha. And if they were laid down by the Buddha, you should not change them. That's uh, in other suttas. Where was that? Oh, I forget exactly where it is now. But it means that the Buddha is recommending the rules be kept. Another place he said it could be changed. What on earth was the Buddha talking about? So these rules of Vinaya, the only time that they tend to be um, controversial is when people don't understand them. And they interpret them as really weird sometimes. So some of the, the rules which people said they understood, I look in the books, that's not what the rule says. They're always very kind and compassionate, usually. But when it comes to sort of the rules of the bhikkhunis, the vinaya, you know that you know, the bhikkhuni sangha was not very active, and it just almost died out with what it did die out. And so many of those rules were not really, please excuse me, were cared for. They weren't, weren't preserved. And so you, you really have a lot of doubt, some of the things which came in, some of the things were deleted, some of the things which were added, and some of the controversies, different ways you can look at the rules. And so you go back to something which the Buddha said, the purpose of these rules. The purpose of these rules were to protect the Bhikkhuni Sangha and the Bhikkhu Sangha, obviously protect the lay people you know, from, from harm, to inspire people to inspire people with no faith and to increase the confidence of those who already got faith, already Buddhists. So sometimes you ask yourself, do some of these rules, which either prohibit women becoming full monastics, or which place a monk ahead of a female monastic, does that inspire people? Does that increase faith in those who have faith and establish faith in those which doesn't have faith. In other words, they go against the whole purposes, the stated purposes of these trading rules. And that's where you can focus on. Make sure it protects, say, the bhikkhunis, so they have a clear path to practice their meditation and attain the state of enlightenment. That's what you know, those rules are there for, to protect you, Ayachanda and give you way more time and space than you have now. 
so you can really get into your deep meditations. And it's also to inspire faith in people. You're a renunciant. You give up so much. You don't abuse people. You don't get money for yourself. You know, when you go and visit her, see what she's got in her house. Not much. When you actually see those things, it inspires faith. This is the real nun, the real monastic. That's what those vineyard rules are there for. They're training rules. Training rules of protection, guidance, and inspiration. And when people, uh, you know, that I live in a cave. It's not a very big cave. And I just, even it's my bedroom, okay? That's where I meditate and sleep at night. But nevertheless, I think it's the only bedroom which is a tourist attraction. People ask to go and have a look in there. And I don't mind. As long as I'm not in there, obviously. I don't mind any people have a look in there to see just how simple a monk can live. And, you know, it's just, it's not a bed. It's a mattress about an hour, inch and a half. Some water. Okay, it's got bamboo uh, tiles, not bamboo tiles, uh, cork tiles on the floor. It's got electricity. That's it. It's about... So it's a beautiful place, it's simple. I use that to inspire faith in people, but also to teach people you don't need much to live a happy, peaceful, comfortable, healthy life. Great. There's another question about um, bhikkhunis here. Why is it that in the suttas, the Buddha always seems to refer to bhikkhus and there are no places where he speaks to bhikkhunis or females? Is it because bhikkhus is used as an umbrella term for both males and females? I think there's a lot of truth to that. It's an umbrella term. And number two, it is because that the Buddha spent more time living in monasteries where there were bhikkhus. And there were many great bhikkhuni monasteries. But, of course, at night time, that's where he would sleep. In the, imagine he went to a bhikkhuni monastery and slept there at night. You know, unfortunately, that even though there'd be no doubt about the Buddha's conduct, we have something which I call the suspicions of the malicious. And they see that and they would say, look, there must be something going wrong there. So because of that, that the Buddha did separate the residences of the monks and the nuns. And even some of the monasteries, one of the monasteries which I'm building over in Melbourne, that the monks and the nuns live in the same premises, Newbury Buddhist Monastery in Victoria, but they live in different areas of the monastery. And there's like a separation between them, even though it's the same big block of land, about 400 acres or something, maybe more than that, I'm not quite sure, but nevertheless, we have that separation because people just think this is monks and nuns around and they're in the same place and they misbehave. They make good monks and good nuns. They never do that, but still people just always think the worst. They want to put you down. And so they just use those things to create rumors. That's why we have separation. Can I also add that there are some suttas where the Buddha speaks to bhikkhunis or where the bhikkhunis are basically oh, yeah. like um, bhikkhuni Dhammadina, she gives a whole sutta. So, yeah. yeah. And then the Buddha says that, that the way she answered is exactly the way he would have answered as yeah. well. Yeah, you've got the Terigata, the yeah. verses of enlightened nuns, and they're brilliant. And you read yeah. some of those, and I don't care if it's monk or nun. It's beautiful, brilliant stuff. Yeah. Okay, uh, a lifestyle question there for you, Ajahn. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Dear Ajahn, what is the best thing to do for someone who is married and has not yet started a family? If they start to feel joy in meditation and learning the Dhamma and want to spend the rest of their life as a celibate person practicing meditation and learning yeah. Dhamma as a lay person, but they don't want to make the f partner feel abandoned, which is not yeah. fair to the partner. This is actually where you talk that over with your partner. As you have heard me say before and teach before, when you get married, it's not about you. It's not about your partner. It's about us. We make joint decisions. And that's what that's the spirituality of a marriage. You abandon what you want to do for what the family wants to do. 
And that's something I think we forget. It really fascinated me that why do they want, say, a Buddhist monk to give a blessing in a marriage? Number one, I've never been married. And well, what spirituality got to do with you know, one of the most worldly traditions of you know, a couple uh, going together, sleeping together, getting a family together, and enjoying the world together? What's spiritual about that, I ask myself. And of course, there must be something, otherwise they would have marriages in churches or uh, in beautiful places like beaches or mountains. Why do they invite the monk or the nun? Because when you do you know, fall in love and get married, you can see that it's something much bigger than you. And it's something which you're sacrificing yourself. Please, not for your partner. It doesn't work that way, otherwise you get burnt out. It's not for yourself. It's for this third option, it's for us. So you have to let go a lot to have a successful marriage. You don't dominate your partner. You don't, you're not submissive to them. No, you're equal, which means it's all about us. We make decisions together. But that's where you ask your partner. Discuss it. You make your joint decision. Okay, dear Ajahn, how does strict adherence to precepts help progress in meditation? Strict adherence would, would hinder progress. You know, the, the whole idea of strict, where did that come from? You know, it's mostly so from the idea of, please excuse me, but this is the only tradition which I knew, the Christian tradition. Be good, sit up, don't talk when the priest is giving a, a, a lecture or sermon. You go to hell. And as a little kid, you got scared. I should tell people, I used to go to church a lot when I was young. And I had a very good voice. So I was in the choir. And I loved accepting invitations on a Saturday to go to marriages. <laughs> and the reason was, you know, your cute little kid had a good voice. And so you sang as beautiful as possible. Try to get eye contact, usually with the bride or sometimes with the um, with the, the groom. And they'd give you tips. And I know I didn't get any pocket money anywhere else. And so those little tips from, from church, that's my own money, is a really good earner, a good source of income. I never told my parents about that. And he said, I'm going to, to church today, Dad. And he said, oh, okay. And so it's a wonderful little little excuse for making money for a little poor kid, you know, in the poor part of London at the time. And so I love church, but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> but anyway, just, I did notice that all the pews were hardwood, there's hardly any cushions, it was cold and stony, and the priest usually gave, you know, really fierce um, sermons, you've got to come to church or you go to hell or whatever. And that type of teachings, you know, that, encourage a strictness. These days, well, the precepts which I teach, and, sorry, the precepts which I keep, they're natural. Now who want, I always say that the, the, um, the teachings of the Buddha to his son Rahula, just keep two precepts. Don't do anything which harms another human being or any being. Don't do anything which harms yourself. That's it. It's the two precepts which the Buddha gave to Ananda. So the Buddha gave to Rahula. And from that, we get all the 311 rules for Bhikkhuni, the 227 for a monk, all the 10 precepts, 8 precepts, all 5 precepts. Don't harm yourself or harm others. Is that strict? I can't see that strict at all. It's common sense. Thank you, Ajahn. If one feels a bit overwhelmed with life at the moment and sits down to meditate, how can one bring joy up in the mind? Oh, well, easy. You're meditating, you're free of the world for a while. When you go on holiday and you feel free, suppose I sometimes tell people, what if, if you know, I find one of my wealthy supporters and they decide as an experiment to give the best question or the person who asked the best question this evening, this wonderful holiday, don't forget about COVID or whatever, they smug you overseas. Where would you love to go? Where would you love to go to get away from your work and from England and COVID or, or to get away from um, 
from your, your little house in, in June Street in Oxford and just to go on holiday somewhere, to be free of all this work. And, oh, yeah, I'm free. This is wonderful. So much joy. So I'm offering you that. Sit down and meditate and let go of the whole of June Street, the whole of Oxford, all your responsibilities and duties, all the organization just totally disappears. It's a holiday. And when that starts to happen, you appreciate it so much. You get joy. Yay! So you have a little bit of freedom from suffering. You don't have to think so much and plan so much or worry so much. You have some freedom from uh, your body. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. The body always aches or is tired. So you meditate and you can't feel the body anymore. Yay! It's a holiday. It's one of the reasons why and you know this, because every time I've been in England and taught any type of retreat, I give it a name. Club Med. It's club meditation, not club Mediterranean. That's not a holiday. Club meditation means you're having a holiday from your busy world. And calling it a holiday means it's enjoyable. So you expect joy there, you see joy there, and it's there. And once you start being joyful, then you find that you don't wander off anywhere. On the retreat, I was just teaching the usual question, why does my mind wander off? Does it, does it need to wander off? Are you being told by me to go and think about something? Is your boss ordering you to make a decision on that contract? Is you know, your university asking you to make a, a, um, a submission on your or, or an essay upon your meditation experiences? No, you are totally free. You don't have to think at all. So why do you? So after a while, you realize the only reason why we think and fantasize and think of the past or project onto the future is just something to do. It's an escape. Just like looking in the refrigerator in the afternoon, seeing if there's anything to eat. And the freezer is packed full of things. No, there's nothing to eat in there. Or when people used to, I don't know if it still happens, they have all these channels on TV. And they come home from work, what am I going to watch? And there's just about 60, 70 channels. There's nothing on TV. Oh, my goodness. Do you remember the time of BBC and ITV, the only two channels we had in England? And, oh, we would fight in my house on which channel was going to be on. <laughs> and 70, 80 channels and there's nothing on? What does that tell you? It's just you want to be satisfied. You're looking for something, and whatever you're looking at doesn't satisfy you, so stop looking. Be still, be peaceful. Let go, stop thinking. In this present moment, silence. Imagine silence. Silence is more beautiful than London Symphony Orchestra playing Beethoven's Fifth. It's gorgeous. And silence is always there. You can turn to it anytime you want. Freedom. Joy. When you notice the freedom and the joy, you train yourself to look for it. We don't make it happen. It's always there, but sometimes we miss it. When you see the joy, it's things like peace, relaxation, stillness. The only thing you've got to do in the whole world is watching a breath go in or a breath go out. That's all. Simple, but incredibly powerful. You bliss out when you start to see the joy it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, deeper and deeper, more powerful. And just nimbus happen, jhanas happen, everything happens. It's so simple. Okay, <laughs> next question. We have a lot of questions, so I'm going to have to just pick out a few, I think, and maybe yeah, we can sure, just yeah. uh, go through sure. them fairly fairly yeah, sure. briefly. Okay, so uh, someone's asking, I often find myself terrified about the nature of the universe. As a scientist, I'm aware of the size of the universe and the fact that humans are insignificant. Although meditation allows me to stop thinking or caring about it, the idea that we're all destined to disappear comes back and terrifies me to the bones. 
How can one live with the idea of being insignificant, eventually disappearing and losing all one's friends and loved ones without getting insane? Oh, well, that's what I do. Don't get insane. I don't try to go insane. The Buddha never got insane. <laughs> In fact, they got pissed out and incredibly happy and peaceful and free. So there's something there which the mind is distorting the information to create fear. Just like sometimes that people say, they told me when I was very young, if you go out late at night, you'll be attacked by the bogeyman. They're waiting for you outside, so you better stay inside. It's just encouraging fear to control you. And you know that many, many times that happens in this world. And sometimes, even like ghosts, ghosts cannot harm you. That's been proven so often. But you're still afraid of them. So if ever you see a ghost, you turn around and you face the ghost. And then the ghost becomes afraid of you. That's my experience. They realize that the only power they have is to create fear and you're not going to pay it. You're not going to play with any fear anymore. It's the same with the Dhamma as well. You know, there's a fear about it, but then there's a truth about it too. And little by little, you get stronger and stronger. You realize you have nothing to lose. Your friends are going to go anyway. And this whole universe, you know, it's going to disappear anyway through science. That's why I was really impressed when a science student when you realize that this, this uh, sun, its future is going to expand and it's going to subsume the orbits of Mercury and uh, Venus. And they're all going to get sort of swallowed up by an expanded sun and the planet Earth, which we spent so much time looking after and building, it's going to just be dust. It's going to evaporate into the universe done this many times. To me, that was actually beautiful as a Buddhist. Everything you build, every monument on this earth will be just reduced to little particles of dust flying through the universe. But then what happens, many parts of that dust will accumulate under a gravitational force and another planet will be born. And that planet will also have people making monuments to last forever not realizing that too will vanish. And this is why I used to tell my students of physics at school, that your body, this is just an obvious truth, but it's you know, quite sort of uh, cool, that your body has been through two supernovae. The only way this universe can create the higher elements, such as you know, lead or iron, is actually from uh, two stars exploding, the first star exploding, the supernova, huge explosion. Now, much bigger than anything we can imagine. You know, so much bigger than sort of nuclear bombs or whatever. The whole big star, just um, huge explosion. And then of all those little um, elements created in that star, they come together in another star and that exploded. And that's your elements which make you up. So if you could ask your body in its history, your body said it went through these massive cataclysms at least twice in its history. That's your body. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, that's so cool. We are star stuff, literally. And it's not so, some hippie. Uh, phenomena based on uh, smoking too much marijuana. This is actually science. It's not scary to me. It's actually gorgeous. Great. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, I think we're coming to the last couple of questions. So um, the first one is that as a lay practitioner living in a non-Buddhist, although supportive setting, how can one find a balance between following one's own needs, more inclined to stillness and learning Dhamma, and the more mundane and entertaining needs of those around one? It's actually, it's not that hard to find that balance. Remember that I wasn't born as a monk. For many years, I was a lay person. And again, just you know, with family and friends. But you find that uh, when you sacrifice what you want to do for the sake of others, that's called giving. 
renouncing. It's not what I want. It's what other people need me to do for them. And when you actually let go of what your own needs, I use the word carefully, letting go, it means it makes it much easier when you have some free time to sit down and let go of everything. You're renouncing when you're looking after a family. You're renouncing when you go to work. How many people want to go to work in the morning? They renounce because they have to. So it's a better reason than just being lazy and staying in bed. So sometimes if you're a monastic and the only thing you do is to meditate, you get cold, you get dull. There's no oomph in your practice. And this is what I saw with many of my friends. Now I was actually helping in what not a chart with visas and goodness knows what else. And, but I had many, much time to meditate as well. But other of those monks whose visas I did for them, they were in the caves and the mountains and the jungles meditating, I thought, all day. And when he came back to do the visa forms, talk with them, their meditation was nowhere near as hot as mine, as good as mine. I couldn't understand it at first. Why? They had all the time. They didn't have the level of renunciation which I had. The level of ability to let go. The ability to serve. So you've heard me say this many times before, Ayachanda, the best part is that balance between serving and solitude. Too much of either, you don't make much practice, much progress. Or oh, sorry, much ingress. <laughs> inside yeah okay so the last one is kind of a nice one to end on I think yeah. Um, yeah I'll just ask it so dear Ajahn you're saying make peace be kind be gentle has helped me to be a better person thank you is this saying also in the Buddhist texts <laughs> okay you know the answer to this one I've <laughs> told you many times the Eightfold Path, the number two, is called Sama Sankapa, which is often called like right intention. Some people even call it right thought, which makes me tear my hair out. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean right thought. Even right intention is not accurate. It's right motivation. It's where you're coming from, not where you're going to. Where you're coming from and the real uh, words the first there's three right motivations one is nekama the second one is a waipada and the third one is a hingsaka and those mean the first one means letting go renouncing giving up and to many people that's a bit too challenging so i use the word make peace the second one, awayapada, is a synonym for metta, for kindness. It means non-ill will. When I saw that, I thought, oh, at last, because I wondered. Somehow you realize that Buddhism is a very kind, compassionate, soft path. Where was that in the Eightfold Path? And I couldn't find it until I looked more deeply and realized that there it was in the second fact of the Eightfold Path, the motivation and this beautiful kindness. Open the door of your heart to this moment, no matter what it is. You don't realize how powerful that is. And then the last one, the gentleness. Basically non-violence, the hingsaka, or we hingsaka, I think it's called in the suttas. But it's the same meaning. I don't know what was made famous by Mahatma Gandhi, non-violence. And just that whole idea of not being violent to your body came out in the the middle way teaching of like resting enough, Venerable Chanda, you get a good <laughs> night's sleep, you don't get stressed out. Learning how to be kind to your body, and then the body is your friend, not something which you dominate. The same thing with your mind, learning how to be kind to your mind. And so, your mind is such a beautiful friend that when you want to meditate, this is how I feel. I've just closed my eyes, been working really hard, teaching, talking to people because they ask for interviews. You go back to your room, say, hey, mind. But no one 
to disturb me now. Let's hang out together. So it's just my best friend. And so the mind doesn't wander anywhere. Yay, we're back together again. Having a lovely, peaceful time. If your mind is your friend, you don't want to go anywhere. There's no such thing as distraction. With someone you love and care for and they care and love for you. A wonderful time. It doesn't take any striving. You don't have to hold your mind in your fist and don't let it go. Or hold your breath or whatever your meditation object is. You know what that feels like. That To me, that can't be Buddhist. It doesn't feel like it's Buddhist. And of course, it isn't <laughs> Buddhism. Trying to hold things, imprison them, dominate them. It doesn't work. And being kind to them. And I'm kind to say to my breath, my poor old breath has been breathing in for almost 70 years now. Breathing out. It's done it so well for all this time. And so when I watch my breath, ah, it's like holding a kitten in your lap. <laughs> you start stroking it and you love each other and you're kind to each other. And that kitten just stays there. It doesn't go anywhere. So if your mind wanders off, say, when you're watching your breath, there's something you're trying to, to make it be there rather than use your wisdom to let it be there. So I know I've talked a lot and some of it's been very deep and it's been great if I could have uh, talked more about it but you know this is our time I think I've given you enough yeah there. Ajahn there is one more question I want to come okay. to because it's important yeah. and yeah, I think sure. the, it's important so okay let's end on this one instead yeah. okay how would you suggest someone go about coming back to their practice or faith after having been harmed or disillusioned by their Ajahn or their community? Remember that you don't ever have an Ajahn, one teacher. When you were at school, how many teachers taught you maths? When you're at university, how many teachers taught you sociology or whatever you studied there? You always have many teachers. And you learn so much from each one. And, you know, if... The teacher didn't teach you good dharma, at least they taught you something. So always have this gratitude for you know what the teacher actually taught you. Even if it's taught you, don't ever practice like that again. You learned something. So have gratitude rather than criticism. There's that little story which I mentioned in passing, the two bad bricks in the wall. When you see only the two bad bricks in the wall, for me, when I made those two bad bricks, that's all I remembered, all I focused on, all I all I saw when I passed that wall, the mistakes and the force. That's why I wanted to destroy that wall. I hated that wall. And sometimes there may be a person in your life who's abused you, hurt you, maybe a teacher who's taught some really stupid things because they didn't really know yet. So remember, they also taught some good things as well. So the 98 good bricks in the wall. And so focus on the good bricks which I've taught you. You've moved away from them, but you, you never lose at all. You always gain something in your life, how you learn, how you grow. And if you go the wrong path, you realize that's the wrong path. I won't go down there again. But don't go in the, along the path of rejection or anger or just negativity. That doesn't help you. Instead, use gratitude. Use the fact that well, I learned something there. And therefore you grow ever wiser, ever stronger. And that becomes your spiritual path. In the Bible, we learn from so many people. And each one of them, we learn what is useful for us at this time. We grow from it. And the spiritual path, it's, you may say you don't want to go back to the spiritual path. You can't avoid it. Life is spiritual. And you will always go back to wondering, it's about this mind, this knower, this doer, who's in charge. You can't avoid it. And the best way is obviously to get some deep meditations. You can feel it yourself. You don't doubt. It's your teacher. It's your practice. And I will end with how the Buddha ended. He said, when I pass away, your teacher, he said to all who's Buddhists, 
Your teacher will be the Dhamma and the Vinaya, not a person. We take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. We never take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and Ajahn Brahm. We never take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and Ayachanda. Not individuals, but the teachings and this whole structure which the Buddha left for us. Take the people away. And just fact on something which is impersonal the Dhamma, the Vinaya, and just the institutions which the Buddha set up for us. They're pretty good. Thank you. Okay. That's lovely. Thank you. So we're almost to an end, but I'd like to invite Kelly to say a few words. And after that, I will thank Ajahn Brown properly and also mention something special for everybody here. Um, it's an event that you don't know about yet. Um, so you're some of the first people to get the link for that. So um, just hang on a little bit longer and I'll invite Kelly to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda, for sharing the Dhamma with us this afternoon. I would like to say a few words about the practice of Dana. Dana in Pali meaning generosity, and the Buddha identified it as an important practice on the path. It can help us to let go of our self-interest, cultivate a joyful mind, loving kindness and compassion. So if you would like to offer dana, your gift, whatever you are able to give, will provide for Venerable Chanda's material needs and help her to continue spreading the dhamma, as well as very importantly, supporting the setting up and the development of the first Bikuni Monastery in the UK. Um, you can find more details about the project and on how to donate on the Anacampa website. And the link is also in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly, and thank you to all my co-hosts today, especially uh, Mel, who's been videoing and live streaming this, to Kelly, to Venny, who's been taking the questions. That's a really big job, so I've seen you've been very diligently sending them across, and to Derek as well. You're always such a great support for me. And of course, to Ajahn Brown, whose uh, wisdom and compassion we're just so, so fortunate to partake of. It's just a real privilege and a blessing to have you here Ajahn so thank you very much and also just to thank Ajahn for his support of, of the Bikuni monastery that we are aiming to develop over here and uh, I, I say it's a Bikuni monastery because uh, it will be the first opportunity that women have to take the full training towards um, full ordination as, as Buddhist nuns in the Theravada forest tradition but it's actually a monastery for everybody. So calling it a bhikkhuni monastery sounds like perhaps it doesn't apply to you, but it applies to you as much as it does to us. So it's going to be a space for us to practice as a community. And um, I think, you know, this, this really contributes something more solid in terms of spiritual support. You, know, you won't only be reliant on the resident monastics, but also you'll have each other and you'll have a space to come, which will hopefully be as inclusive as possible. And we'll always be open to feedback on how to make it even more so. So I just really want to thank Ajahn Brown for his support in that project because really we work together on it very closely and you know he guides every little minute detail including in my own journey you know on this path whether it's um, my meditation practice or my decision making around it or just a bit of a moral and emotional support so it's absolutely invaluable and uh, you know it gives me a lot of confidence that this is coming from a very very good place it's got a lot as you once told me Ajahn it's got a lot of good karma behind it oh, <laughs> so yeah. it's the combined practice of you know not only of me but of you as well which together must be at least I worked it out there must be 75 or 80 years worth of combined practice between the two of us Ajahn and not to mention this lifetime yeah, exactly. <laughs> and not to mention the practice of everyone else here and yeah. everyone else who's involved. So it's really inspiring. So I don't know if you want to say a few words on that, Ajahn, um, yes, but just because, to thank you. Because again, we have established monasteries for monks and nuns here in Australia. And to see their effect just on people, it's your community. It inspires you. 
you go there for some peace and some rest. And what it, what I, um, I used to call them nuns factories. It's not nuns factories, it's like bliss factories. You go there and you just get so happy and joyful. It's, that is pure when you see something like this occurring and growing. So I have no, no doubt it's going to happen. If I just want it to happen fast, it's just because I just I just see its results over here. Just want come on, let's have this in England as soon as possible, so you can really sort of not just you, I attend, all the people listening to this talk can actually get so inspired of what we can do. And you go there, and you visit there, you see photos of it. You think, wow, we're responsible for this. We did this. That gives you so much peace and bliss. It's quite easy to get limitations and jobless and stuff. You're making the causes. And it's inspirational. And I often use that word, but I mean, it really is. Fantastic thing that you're doing. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, all right, so um, I have one more announcement then, as, a, as I promised, and this is that myself and Ajahn Brahm have been invited by um, oh. a, a fairly new Buddhist community. No, actually, it's not that new. I think they've been going about 10 years, called New Buddha Way, but the word new is in, the, is in their organisation. And uh, they're very keen to support us and also to learn more about bhikkhuni ordination and why it matters. So on the 1st of May at 1 p.m., British time. Um, um, they're going to be interviewing Ajahn Brahm and myself uh, on the theme of bhikkhuni ordination and why it matters. So I'm popping in the link to that. Basically, in order to join, you have to write an email to the people who are organizing it, retreats at newbuddhaway.org. And um, if you're one of the lucky hundred to get into that, then uh, yeah, then we'll see you there. And I'll, uh, yeah, just pop in the donation link as well, because I'm not sure that's there. Maybe Derek could do that. I think you've got the website. Oh, yeah, it is there. Great. So I think that's it. So thank you so much, everybody, and Ajahn Bram also. And uh, yeah, my pleasure. wave goodbye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Take Bye. care. Bye. Good to see a lot of our friends. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Take care, Ajan, and have a